justiciable. Why do you always want to do it? This has been a problem that we've had to deal with for, for a long time. And uh, our doom as a result of the disappearance of the job is in the forecast. But there are six million jobs out there unfilled, thousands of which happen to be in Massachusetts, even Massachusetts, because we've got a lousy system of worker training and placement. Uh, I mean, six, did I say six thousand, six million? Uh, these are, we're calling them middle skill jobs. They require skills, they don't require college degrees, but they require training. They may lead to a college degree. Can't fill them. So what's gonna happen, so what's gonna happen to all the truck drivers? Well, these middle skill jobs are natural for all these folks that are driving trucks. Well, uh, you couldn't be very careful with this, I agree with you, but I yeah. think you have to be careful that any of these job labor exchanges, uh, that you get jobs not of equal pay, necessarily, but equal dignity. To be sure. And dignity is a very important part of the work. I agree with you. Yeah, yeah and I'd like to ask a general question. Are we in a consensus here that AI automatically means uh, a diminution of the size of the job market? Because uh, heretofore, uh, all kinds of mechanization have increased jobs, not decreased. That may be true. That may be true yeah. because you create a lot of wealth and people go out and do other things. I mean, that's, that's the, yeah. the nature of the thing. What I'm concerned about isn't a dramatic reduction of jobs. There'll be plenty of jobs out there because this wealth will create new jobs. It's whether or not we have a system of education and training which, which creates opportunities for these folks who are truck drivers or whatever. Look, we were putting 15,000 single women on welfare to work when I was governor for years. And people said it was hopeless. I mean, they would be underclass, this, that, and the other thing. These were welfare mothers. 75% of them never saw welfare again. What were they doing? All kinds of stuff. Some of them are, are now, <laughs> they call me up and tell me they run a business. Is that you because of policy you were implementing? Huh? Is that because of policy that you're implementing? Well, I'd like to say, think it was. <coughs> Uh, what's happened to the famous Massachusetts EP program? It's disappeared. Don't ask me why. We're not doing it. We still have 55,000 families on public assistance, and we have the worst labor participation rate, training rate, for those folks of any state in the country. 7% of our welfare recipients are in job training. Wow. Crazy. This is well, crazy. Well, there's lots of program to do this. Well, yeah, I mean, to that end, I mean, for who benefits? I think in digging into like what is an ethical framework for each specific AI project, you know, you could look at what is the mission of the project, what is the transparency of it, does it deserve to be open source, or is it something that should be possibly, you know, in a autonomous weapon sense, you know, obviously open source blueprints for that leaking are probably not a good idea, but in more general purpose mm -hmm. utilities, open source is extremely crucial also security and then yeah I mean if if they're generating all this wealth is there some sort of cooperative structure for sharing the the fruits of that of that Let me give you another example um, Wyoming it turns out mines more coal than any other state in the country it's not West Virginia and miners are getting laid off why because coal is not expensive they're being hired as wind technicians because Wyoming happens to have a lot of wind and the only qualification, they're better jobs, you're not in the mines, and the only qualification is that you're not afraid of heights. Um, so, heights. So, <laughs> yeah, so miners are now becoming wind technicians. But yeah. why? Because there's a whole new opportunity out there to get into the clean energy industry. The question, I mean, the thing that I'm concerned about is, is this country, or for that matter, the world, but this country in particular, uh, equipping itself to take advantage of this? And I think the answer to that question is not very low, which is one of the reasons why you've got all these unhappy people in one industry towns. Now, we went through that situation in Massachusetts. I mean, Haverhill was a shoe town, Lowell was a textile town, Redwood was a textile town. What's happened? Well, I'd like to think, I mean, it wasn't anybody's particular I would like to think we kind of organized ourselves. Obviously, we have this great resource in higher education, David, which, which has a great deal to do with our relative success. Our only problem now is that it's mostly concentrated in the eastern third of the state, and the folks out there in western Massachusetts 
aren't getting the advantage. There are ways to do it, like, for example, hooking them up with a crane so they can get on a crane. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. boss, I mean, this, this, is not, this is not rocket science, folks, but it is, it, it does require, I think, uh, the public sector, a, 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 a serious focus on, on creating the systems that will produce the folks that can fill these new jobs. And I think that's where we're, we're not doing well. And, and don't be surprised if, if you don't have that, you've got a lot of unhappy people who are not getting the opportunity to take advantage of these jobs because they don't have the skills to, to do it. You know, there's a program called Teach for America. Yeah. And a lot of college grads go yeah. into that, and they start to empty hand, they try their hand at teaching in the public school systems around the right. country. Right. How about starting a, another program, maybe a sort of science program or engineering program, where we bring some of the STEM graduates out and give them opportunities to work with people in their community? I mean, already, I know at my institution, there are a lot <coughs> of students who are out in the Providence community in the schools or helping out with teaching and so yeah. forth. But we maybe just leverage something that's in place. And it's more than that, John. I mean, when I was governor, we did this, this, this message about tech council just being created. And it came to us and they said, we need biotech production workers. Now, frankly, I had no idea what biotech production workers were. Who are they? These, these folks that walk around in those suits, kind of. <laughs> It's not an assembly line, it's all, you know, it's in a biotech company and they're doing all kinds of stuff. So one year post high school training, we put in half the money, they put in half the money. We started training 500 of these folks a week ago. They did get two weeks of credit for the community college, and they started stepping down, but they wanted to do they could. Well, how did 500 of young folks who've <laughs> done excellent jobs land out of high school? We've got a network of regional vocational technical high schools in this state, fortunately. 24 of which are terrific, and Madison Park and Boston are terrible. But that's Boston's fault. But these kids, we've got a waiting line of students trying to get in both tech high school. Every, almost every one of them is going to work. They've got many co-op programs and these kinds of things. So I'm not pessimistic about either our ability to create new jobs with this new wealth, or our ability to get excellent jobs for people at, at every level. The question is, do we have the will or the capacity so, and I think that's that's where we're lacking. And I think it's criminal that we <laughs> we've got you know fifty five thousand single mothers raising kids on welfare. There's no reason for that, and it's just that's our fault. I, I do think that this will require. I mean, given the amount of money that it will actually we'll, we'll need to rethink and the optics of rethink what we do on taxation. Again, I mean, we see this. Right now, it's a big issue in Europe. And, you know, companies like Facebook, they're making huge amounts of money off advertising in, ba in the large countries. Their tax, they're, they're located in Ireland, and they pay almost no tax. But the money is being generated elsewhere. Now, I mean, we see this situation repeated and repeated in all kinds of, uh, by all kinds of companies. I mean, you see, uh, Robotics companies making huge profits, but I mean there has to be some there has to be some kind of compensatory measures. You can't just say okay we'll leave it to the diminishing tax base to pay for the education of people who are displaced by this technology. I mean this is there's some must must be some kind of connection between the two. Right now we see the opposite direction. I'm not very I'm not very optimistic about the ethical performance of some of these companies that, especially the ones that are purportedly liberal and sort of, you know, progressive around Silicon Valley, if you actually look a little more more serious than I thought. Yeah, I mean, you know, when Facebook you know, explicitly refuses to follow federal election commission rules on advertising, it didn't make lots of money by, and re resulted in the kind of ads that were shown in the U.S. election. I've never seen any, because I'm not American, so I wasn't here, but I mean, they explicitly ignored that. And so, I mean, so clearly the profit maximization motive is so great that, you know, you're, you're not going to, I mean, all this happy talk about, oh, we're bringing people together and, and encouraging dialogue. I mean, no, that's nonsense. Uh, and I, so I'm worried about, you know, who's going to pay for, for these? Yeah. Uh, I mean, Will 
the companies that are responsible for the shedding of jobs in certain areas, will they in some way participate <coughs> in the creation of new jobs? This comes back to the issue of policy tools, uh, because now we're in an era where the incentives are perverse and for for greed, and where the regulations are being slashed by the day. So how how do you, as a politician knowledgeable about tech and, and the benefits, think that we can uh, turn around the, the rudder of state, uh, regardless of party, but in, in terms of just the, the, uh, the degree of ignorance versus uh, knowledge about uh, how one can, in a pro-social manner, um, affect policies and technological development? Well, I'm, I'm pessimistic. If you read Tom Nichols, uh, the, uh, the Death of Expertise, he just chronicles page after page how we're going in the wrong direction on listening to expertise. Uh, then I'm kind of concerned. So how can we reverse that? I guess, yeah. again, I think it, it falls on us because we're the so-called experts. And well, a possible way of responding to this crisis is to have someone who has two, uh, two aspects of it. First, they have to understand the problem well to have a reasonable solution to that. Then they have to frame the story that is understood well mm -hmm. by the people who, who are, over whom you want influence. Yeah. So do we have everything that we need here around the table? Maybe we can uh, put it all together in a story. <coughs> but I think, you know, to the extent that AI is hot today, when you were talking about uh, the ethical dimension, but the thought that occurred to me was, if the AI community were to uh, promote the ethical understanding of AI and say that they're going to address the, the problem of unemployment as it might relate to the subject, uh, and then based on that, uh, argue for a retraining story, a re-education story, that's where all the academics, whether they be in at the university level or lower, can play a role. And, right? But the, the first part of that has already happened. The, uh, but <coughs> of course, the politicians aren't listening to it at all. I'm very curious what you see, think is going to happen with taxation in the European Union. Do you feel there is real momentum to fix these issues you mentioned? Like, could Germany have a law saying that if you advertise in Germany, you pay taxes on that revenue in Germany? Uh, or I'm I mean, clamped down on being, Ireland. I mean, this is being argued mm -hmm. here yes, yes. as we speak. Basically. I mean, there, <coughs> there is broad recognition on the part, especially of countries like Germany, France, uh, and large countries that provide the bulk of revenue for social media and see no benefits from it. This is not yet at the problem of the jobs being displaced. It's simply revenue that mm -hmm. they're not getting uh, for. for activity on their, you know, uh, by people on their territory. That's still a low level problem compared to robotization in which you know, companies produce unemployment and, but, I mean, but they're not really paying for it. It's, I mean, in fact, companies that reduce employment through robot or, or automation, in fact, are paying less taxes because they're not right. paying social taxes. I mean, the social tax mm -hmm. is a kind of rate of around 30 to 35 percent for most countries in Europe. Uh, I mean, you know, mm -hmm. health, depending on how the health care system is and so forth, but the welfare and all those things. I mean, you end up, you're, you're ending up with companies saving money by going, by automatizing and creating <coughs> problems for society that are with, with less money for the solution of those problems retraining whatever welfare whatever it is um, and I don't think I've not seen that really addressed by any politicians yet because it's still you're thinking about the next election cycle you're not thinking about where will we be in five years you're thinking yeah. Europe is always after your next election cycle yeah, what you're describing f f explains perfectly data that Eric Brynjolfsson at the Sloan School I mentioned is seeing where if you look at the of all the income that a company has what how many percent of that go out to the labor in salaries to the workers and how many percent go to the shareholders to the capital that has been a percentage which has been remarkably stable for like 50 years but in recent years the labor fraction of that gets smaller and smaller 
and the fraction that goes to capital larger and larger because of technology. Because, of course, if you can build it with machines, it's not going to be salaries anymore. <coughs> it's going to be those who own the machines who, who get the money. And I mean, the obvious solution to that is just to dial up the taxation a little bit so that you still get the same amount of revenue so you can take care of everybody. Uh, the, the the recent tax plan of the U.S., which I know you love dearly, <laughs> uh, is going exactly in the opposite direction. Right. And, uh, and by the way, it's a product of fake news because the corporate tax rate in America, in, in fact, is not the highest in the country. It's not 35 percent. It's 18. And we're kind of in the middle of the pack, and we're listening to this crap about how we're paying the highest corporate taxes in, a, in the world. Um, well, and I think this has been a great discussion. I hope, uh, Swan tells me we've got to kind of bring this to a pause. I hope we can take off from within our circle and really, with the help of all of you, go at this. You know, part of it is just massive disinformation. Um, part of it is ignoring the lessons of history. You know, we've been going through this process for a long time, and, and our demise has always been predicted, but that doesn't mean we shouldn't be taking it seriously, because there are solutions here, folks. A lot of them are political, mm -hmm. and it's us politicians and you guys that know this stuff that have got to spend a lot of time together, but uh, I sense among politicians a much greater willingness to gain experts into the process, not the other way around, and uh, it'll be interesting to see where we go from here, but thank you very much. Thank you, particularly, and uh, we look forward to it. And uh, this is the exciting the first uh, discussion we will name every Monday group, that is uh, uh, AI in society, Black and Blue. And uh, this is the first uh, session we do. Thank you so much for your contribution for AI in society today. And we hope to continue to stay in touch and uh, discuss more and prepare and a report and an initiative to announce April 25 uh, to our 37 summit this year we do with Canada uh, government for 37 summit so we will contribute uh, initiative about AI you know, okay. AI society in April 25 so thank you so much for the first great session thank you so much for thank you too for attending thank you thank you so much for your yeah, the leader. Yeah, the leader.